Good morning and welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Sunday morning, May 31st, 2015. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin, which is part of the Survey of the Old Testament series, is entitled, Words of Wisdom. If you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 13 with me, if you would. I'm continuing... Uh, My survey of the Old Testament, uh, we did three uh, sermons in the book of Proverbs, I mean, excuse me, in the book of Psalms, and uh, now we're going to move to Proverbs, and then we'll go straight into Ecclesiastes, Uh, but uh, the title of today's sermon is Words of Wisdom, Words of Wisdom. We'll be looking at Proverbs 13 here in just a few minutes. Let me go ahead and give you my outline. If you want to follow us in the bulletin and fill in the blanks, uh, three things wise men do. I want to give you today three things wise men and women, okay? It's not just for men. Uh, wise men and women do. Number one, they listen to instructions. They listen to instructions. Number two, they work with their hands. They work with their hands. And number three, they guard their words. They guard their words. Uh, So remember these three things as we start. Uh, As an introduction, I want to share with you that the book of Proverbs is one of the books classified as a poetry of Scripture. Solomon is the writer of the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Proverbs is basically a book of wisdom. A proverb is a saying that conveys a specific truth in a matter-of-fact way. Matter of fact, many of the Proverbs, a couple of them we'll see today, they're just, they cut the chase and they go straight uh, to the point. The book of Proverbs seems to be a collection of sayings without any particular regard for order, arrangement, or flow. And that's why sometimes uh, it's hard just to start at the front of Proverbs and read, because many of the verses, I mean, the ver- there'll be one verse on a subject, And the very next verse changes a thought pattern, and uh, it's hard uh, to read because of the lack of flow. It was written for everyone to enjoy, but teenagers and young adults seem to be the target uh, age group of this wisdom book. It is said that Proverbs is a thumbnail sketch of every character in the Bible. Reading, memorizing, and applying the Proverbs to your life will not only make you wise, but it will also make you morally and spiritually strong in the Lord. There there is so much wisdom to be found in the book of Proverbs. Before we go to Proverbs 13, I want to go to 1 Kings 4 and look at Solomon. 1 Kings 4, I just want to look at four verses there. 1 Kings 4, verse 29. 1 Kings 4, 29 says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. Okay, wisdom is one thing, but notice the descriptions and the words they're using there. Exceedingly great understanding. Okay? And largeness of heart like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon was known as the wisest man that ever lived. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And if you want to read verse 31, have at it there. There are the names that I can't pronounce too well. And uh, he was wiser than them all. But I really want to get to verse 32. This is the key. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. So when we look at the proverbs and we look at the psalms and we look at uh, songs, in the Song of Solomon, I'm telling you, that's just a a brief uh, writing of all that he did. 3,000 Proverbs. Folks, that's amazing that anybody even could write all that down and then 1,005 of his songs. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13, if you would, with me. And number one, listen to instructions. Listen to instructions. Proverbs 13, 1. A wise son 
heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A wise son listens to his father's instructions. Why do we have instructions in the first place? I mean, you order something, and it's one of those put-together things. And I'll be honest with you, folks, that frustrates me, okay? I always have to have Lori's help because she don't mind reading the instructions. So she reads it to me, and I put things together. But why? So that we will do it the right way. This proverb speaks of a father's and son relationship, but folks, it also speaks of a Christian's and our Heavenly Father's relationship. God gives us instructions. This book is our instruction book. And folks, we need to read the Word of God. Last night while I was studying this, uh, God spoke to me again and He said, you know what, you haven't read through Proverbs uh, verse by verse in a long time. And starting tomorrow, and I, I hope some of you will do this with me, but starting tomorrow, I pray that many of you will take whatever day it is, tomorrow's the first, and we will read the first chapter of Proverbs. And then Tuesday, the second, we're going to read the second chapter of Proverbs. And I pray many of you will read through the Proverbs with me for the month of June. Why? Because there's instructions there. Because there's wisdom there. I'm telling you, God says you're, He doesn't leave us without instructions. But we have to pull the book out. We have to look at the Word of God to know what He is thinking and how we need to be acting as Christians. Hold your finger there and go to Proverbs 4. We're going to look at several passages in Proverbs. Proverbs 4, verse 1. Proverbs 4, 1. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father. Now, folks, my father tended to be one of those no-nonsense guys. All right? I mean, he did not play. He, You know, there was times I thought, you know, he didn't have a sense of humor. And for some reason, God gave me a huge sense of humor. So a lot of times, it was there was just friction. That's the best way I can put it. All right? He would look at me, and, and, and he would be giving me instructions to do something. And I would just not give eye contact to him. And he'll say, look at me, son. Are you listening to me? And I'm telling you, when I was little, I remember him grabbing my face and putting his face in my face and saying, listen to what I'm saying. And you know what else he did? He had made me repeat his instructions. And you know what that did? That made me have to listen. Because if I didn't repeat it, I'm telling you, I got chided for not knowing and not listening to what he said. And folks, I'm sure I was ADD. I'm sure I was, when I was a kid, there is no doubt in my mind. I was a challenge. I was, all right, uh, full of life. Whatever you want to say. But folks, here the Bible clearly says, hear my children the instructions of a father and give attention to no understanding. Folks, we don't know all there is to about life. We haven't been through every situation in life. And I am telling you, the Word of God addresses every situation in life. There's not one. You may have to dig it. And that's why we need to know the Word of God. So that we can go and someone asks us and we can find Scripture and we can memorize Scripture and we can just spout out Scripture to people that need counseling. Folks, people need instructions. People need to know the way. People need to know what the Word of God says. And there is understanding and instructions in the Word of God. Look at verse 2. For I give you good doctrine. What's good doctrine? Folks, it's sound thinking. It's not just logic. It's not just logic. We need to be logical in our decision-making process. But I'm telling you, we need to be godly also in our decision-making process. We need to know what God would do. We need to think, what would Jesus do? We need sound doctrine in our thinking. Do not forsake my law. And that's not talking about just the first five books of the Bible, folks. It's not just the Ten Commandments. We need to know what all of the Bible says. All of it applies to us. All of the Word of God makes us wise. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, 
He also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Remember the sayings of your mom and your dad and some sayings of your grandparents? Why did they tell you these things? So you would not make the same mistakes that they had made. Folks, we need to listen to the voice of experience. We need to listen to the to the wisdom of our parents and our grandparents. Then verse 5. Man, I love this. Exclamation point. Twice. Get wisdom. Let me say it again. Get wisdom. That's not an option. He just said it's a commandment. It's your job to dig into the Word of God and find wisdom. I mean, you can't just lay the Word of God beside you and hope it jumps into your head sometime. You've got to read the Word to know what He's thinking, to know what His instructions is, to know what Jesus would do. Folks, that's what the Gospels are for. They were written about Jesus' life so that we could mimic Him, so that we could follow Him, so that we could listen to His instructions. The world gives us one set of instructions, and the Bible gives us another set of instructions. So God says in verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding. That means pursue it. That means go after it. That means find it. Look for it. Do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Notice what it says. Her is not the mom there. Her speaking of wisdom. Folks, we need to pursue it. She will help us. Wisdom will guide us. Wisdom will help us be wiser and more understanding and make good decisions. The opposite of that is foolishness, folks. In Proverbs, it says a fool many, many times. And we don't need to be foolish in God's eyes. We need to be wise. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Listen to me, folks. Every one of us need more wisdom in our lives. I am 56 years old and I've learned many things not to do. All right, why? Because I was dumb enough to do them. Thank you, Orville. <laughs> and folks, I am telling you, we need to learn from experience. We need to read the Word of God and find wisdom. It is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. It says it again. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Why would he say it twice in three verses? Because it's very, very important. Listen to me, young people. Get wisdom. You're not, I, I know when I was your age, I thought my parents didn't know anything. I really did. I thought I was wise. But the older I got, the more I realized the foolish I was. And if you're going to be wise, folks, you need to get wisdom. You need to know the Word of God. You need to seek the Word of God. You need to memorize the Word of God. You need to read the Word of God. You need to meditate on the Word of God because there is much wisdom there. Proverbs 1. Turn to Proverbs 1. Verse 7. Proverbs 1, 7. I'm telling you, if I had to say, show me a group of sentences, show me three verses that sum up the book of Proverbs, this would be it here. These would be the key verses. Fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord, excuse me. The fear of the Lord. What is that? That's in awe. That's respecting the Lord. Okay? That's humbling yourself before the Lord. It's the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Oh, folks, we need wisdom and instruction in our lives. My son, hear the instruction of your father. And do not forsake the law of your mother. For they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains around your neck. What is that? Folks, I am talking about something that reminds you. Reminds you. It's like a necklace. A cross necklace. What does the cross necklace remind you? It reminds you of Jesus Christ. It reminds you of Him dying on the cross for your sins and mine. And folks, wisdom reminds you of God Himself. I'm telling you, God is wisdom. Wisdom can be found in His holy word. 
Deuteronomy 6. Go to Deuteronomy 6 with me. Why Deuteronomy? Because I'm telling you, he's speaking to the children of Israel. He's speaking to his chosen one. And this is the first instructions that God gives Moses. Look at verse, or chapter 6, verse 1. Now this is the commandment. These are the statutes and judgments with the Lord, which the Lord God commanded you to teach, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. Why? Because the Canaanites were not like them. Because the Canaanites did not worship Jehovah God. Because their traditions and their beliefs and their religion was different from the children of Israel. So God tells them, get wisdom. Listen to the instructions. This is what you need to focus on. Folks, I am telling you, the world is trying to tell our children and trying to tell us how to live. And we cannot go by what the world philosophy says. We have to go by the word of God that you may fear the Lord your God and keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you four times in two verses. He says these are commandments. That's not an option. We've got to do these in our lives, which I command you in your son and your grandson all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord uh, your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Folks, I'm telling you, a wise Christian will follow God's commandments. A wise Christian will follow God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind, and with all of their bodies. That's what the Word of God says. Now James chapter 1. Let's give some New Testament. New Testament application to this. James 1, verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man, now we get these mixed up and in the wrong order, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. What is it? What does it say? Swift to hear. Why do you think God gave you two ears and one mouth? You ever think about that? Two ears. So that we can hear all the way around us, and we will speak about one mouth here in just a few minutes. All right? In slow to wrath. What is he saying? God's saying, listen, folks. Listen. You can't just do what you feel. You can't just do what you want. Folks, we were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. We were bought with His blood. We need to be Christians. We need to use wisdom and understanding and knowledge in everything we do. Listen. Two, instruction. Number two, wise men work with their hands. Work with their hands. Look back in Proverbs. I was amazed at going through here again and again, just picking out what I feel like God wanted me to touch on today. And folks, for some reason, we have lost a work ethic in this modern Christendom. Okay? I'm talking about the farmers that would get up. I'm talking when it was still dark. And they would work until it was dark. I'm talking about factory workers that would work. And, and, and nowadays, I am telling you, a good eight hours would kill a teenager these days. The first thing, they go into a, a job and they go into a, an interview, the first thing they want to know, you know what they want to know? How long do I have to work and what am I going to make? Folks, I've been around them. And I am telling you, being a good worker. Working is a good Christian ethic. I tell you, I, I learned mine from my father. I'm telling you, Southwestern Vale just about worked him to death. He did. He, I mean, he would get up early. We did not eat breakfast with my father. He would get up and mom would cook his breakfast before she would do ours because he had to be out of the house by 7 o'clock. And then... When it was supper time, mom cooked three meals a day for all four of us kids. 
And I'm telling you, when it was supper time, we would eat it without him. She would cover a plate and put food in there, and it ne you, we never knew what time he was coming in. It could be 6, it could be 7, it could be 8 o'clock. He would unwrap that food, he would eat it, he would get his paper, he would read the newspaper, and then I'm telling you, he would shower, he would read the Word of God, and he'd go to bed. He would work 12 to 14 hours every day. And I am telling you, folks, we as Christians need to be good examples of good workers. You're being paid for what you are doing. All right? You're being paid. And you need, whether somebody is watching you or not, if you are on the clock, you need to be a good worker. Look at verse 2 in our text. Proverbs 13.2 A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth. But the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. Folks, I am telling you, our government is messed up in the welfare system. We are messed up. Folks, there are certain people, I totally agree, if you have special needs or if you are physically unable to work, we need to help you. But there are many, many thousands of people that just will not work. They do not have a good work ethic. And folks, I am telling you, I know one thing. I managed a restaurant. I managed a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> Go figure that. All right. When I was 22 years old. And I am telling you, if you wouldn't work, I didn't keep you. My job was to see that you worked. I had an owner that I had to be responsible to. And even as a 22 year old, I knew who was working and who wasn't. I saw what there was going on. And folks, it is a horrible Christian testimony for you not to work when you're being paid for what you did. It's a terrible testimony. Look at four. Look at chapter, or verse four. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Folks, I, I have had people tell me, Mike, do you ever take a day off? Well, folks, I try. But when I do, you know what I find out? I think of somebody that I need to call or somebody that I need to visit. And I'm just telling you, I don't work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But I'm simply saying, I love what I do. And I want to be the best pastor and Christian I can possibly be. Folks, there's no room for laziness in the kingdom of God. We're talking about God's work. We're talking about church work. It is the most important work there is. I am telling you, after the curse, after Adam and Eve had fallen, the Scripture tells us that we work by the sweat of our brow. And we need to do that. Folks, I'm all for vacations. Man, if you got a vacation, take a vacation. Sometime in September, you're not going to see me for about eight to ten days. Don't call me. Call Brother Steve. <laughs> Why? Because everyone needs some time off. I'm simply saying, when you work, you need a good work ethic. There are way too many lazy people in this world. And I am telling you, idleness is the devil's workshop. That's what the Word of God teaches us. Proverbs 19. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here. Proverbs 19, verse 15. Laziness cast one into a deep sleep. An idle person will suffer hunger. Okay? I'm just telling you. You better be glad you don't live in the early 1900s. All right? Because, I mean, it's like teaching these young kids, like some of you like girls, teaching you to can. All right? I'd like to see some of you girls can green beans. Ooh, the smell? Are you kidding me? I'll get my nails messed up. You would go hungry. I mean, now it's fast foods. We just go and order it. For a dollar, we can have anything that we want for a dollar. Dollar menu, dollar menu. But I'm telling you back in then, if you didn't work, you didn't eat. You raised your own vegetables. You made things work. And he's saying, I am telling you, a lazy man is a sluggard. Look, look at verse 24. I'd never seen this verse. I just read through this chapter and I'd never seen this. A lazy man bears his hand in the bowl and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Are you kidding me? If I'm going to scoop the food, I'm going to put it in my mouth. There are some people that are so lazy, they will not even get their own food. Folks, that's pitiful. I would hate to even think that was said of me. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10.4. Proverbs 10.4. He who has a slack hand 
Folks, that's lazy. Becomes poor. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in the summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in the harvest is a son who causes shame. Oh, listen to me, folks. Always save money. Always, always, always. If you can only put $5 a week away, put $5 a week away. Plan. Be wise with your finances and with work. 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. Go there with me. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Listen to me, young people. Stay away from fools. They're going to get you in trouble. And adults too. There are foolish adults. People that make bad decisions, stay away from them. You are going to make bad decisions and you're going to make foolish decisions. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. You can't always be looking for a handout. You can't always... I mean, folks, I am telling you, you've got to work to eat. That's what the Word of God... I'm fixing to read it to you right out of the Word of God. But worked with labor and toiled night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Folks, I am telling you, everyone can do something. You can do something. There is something you can do to work. There is something that you can do for the Lord. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Folks, I have heard when I was younger especially, all right, those lazy preachers. Folks, that would just go, Steve, that just, that gall, that scalded me. Folks, I determined in my heart of hearts that I would never, that would never be said of me. And we as Christians, we don't need to be lazy Christians. Look at verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, when you work a good hard day, when you put in eight to ten hours of labor, you're not hanging around over in the phone, on the phone saying, Oh, did you? I don't know what you did. Going like that. Why? Because you want to eat, you want to take your shower, and you want to go to bed and work the next day. Folks, I am telling you, we as Christians need to have a great work ethic. One more. All right? You can tell this bugs me. Okay? It bugs me. I want you to understand Christians should not be lazy. 1 Corinthians 10.31 1 Corinthians 10.31 Therefore whether you eat or drink or whatever you do okay, whatever you do do all to the glory of God. Listen folks, I don't care if you're a trash man. You need to be the best trash man on your route. I don't care if you dig ditches. You need to be the best ditch digger there is. I'm amazed at people that don't have a job. And here's what I've heard. I have heard this. I cannot work for $12 an hour. Really? Kids, I'm telling you the truth. 14 years old, my first job, Baskin Robbins ice cream. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> I made 90 cents an hour. 90 cents an hour. And I'm telling you, in the summer, we work like dogs. If you don't have a job, you don't, you should not be asking what it would pay. You should ask, where do we start? Where can I start? Folks, it's earned. You've got to work your way up. You think I just came to Rye Hill Baptist Church and said, you know what? I want to be a senior pastor. They'd have looked at me like, are you kidding me? Folks, I'm telling you, I spent 14 years in the youth ministry. I spent 10 years as an associate pastor. I've been 11 years as a pastor. You've got to work your way up. And I don't care what this is saying. Whatever you do, don't do it to man. You are working for God. Do it to the glory of God. You are showing a Christian work ethic when you do that.
We are not supposed to be like the world. We're not supposed to be lazy. Some people work harder at getting out of work than working. You make it a thing. Folks, work with all of your heart. Man, I feel better. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Words of wisdom. Three things. Listen to instructions. Work with their hands, and wise men guard their words. All right. It's time for confession. (laughs) I'm still working on this. I'm telling you, I still mess up, and it's in humor. I just find things humorous, and I don't really mean it. I really don't. But... (laughs) I have to slap myself sometimes because I am guilty of this. And the Lord really, really worked me over on this. Folks, Proverbs 13, verse 3. Steve, I think we'll use that as our memory verse. Let's go ahead and get our memory verse out of the way today, okay? He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Remember the verse we talked about earlier, James 1.19? Folks, I am telling you, we talk, we, I'm including me, way more than we should. We give folks opinions when they don't ask our opinion. We tell them instructions when they didn't, we, we hadn't told them. We try to tell them how to live when we can't even take care of our own lives. This says, he who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Folks, what we say and how we say it is extremely important. What we say and how we say it. You can be right, but if you're yelling it, I am telling you, you will not get your point across. And adults, I'm just telling you, we really mess up with our children and grandchildren. I am just not believing what I hear in stores. I I mean, I've heard them. You're stupid. You're an idiot. On ball fields. You do not have to curse. You do not have to curse to motivate folks. Matter of fact, I'm just telling you, my kid would not go. My kid will not be under a cussing coach. He shouldn't have to do that. Folks, cursing is the language of of idiots, of the ignorant. And folks, we need to watch what we say. Proverbs 18. Go to Proverbs 18. Guard your words. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Folks, I'm telling you, you can beat a kid down. A kid that struggles in school. If you tell him he's stupid, eventually he's going to think he's stupid. If you tell him you can't do it, and folks, I never tell a kid you can't do it. I tell him you can do it because the Scripture says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We need to be the biggest cheerleader in our home. We need to show a positive attitude and have positive reinforcement in their life. There is life and death in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. Watch what you say. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10.19. Proverbs 10.19. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. What does it mean? Folks, you don't always have to get the last word in. You don't even always have to answer. If somebody comes at you and attacks you, I am telling you, I've been attacked uh, in church hallways. I've been attacked on church parking lots. I've been in in parsonage in Alma. I've been attacked. And here's what I say. On the phone, I've been attacked. And you know what I say? When you calm down and when you can quit yelling, we will have a conversation. Folks, it takes two. It takes two. You need to be calm in what you're saying. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lip is wise. Listen to me, folks. Think before you speak. Think. I ask myself these questions. I try to do it every time. We must ask ourselves, is it true? Is what I'm saying the truth? Is it necessary? Are my words necessary? Is it edifying? Is it edifying? Is it gossip? Is it gossip? Will these words help this person? Or will these words hurt this person? Folks, 
Screen your words. Words are powerful. Think about what you say. Verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. It's just like somebody spewing off and just telling you, telling you off like that. Folks, just let them spew. What does it really matter what they say? Why do I really even care what they say? A fool is going to spout off eventually. Just let them go. Don't engage in an argument is what it's saying. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. A soft answer turns away wrath. What does that mean? Folks, somebody yelling, don't, don't yell back at them. Just use a soft voice. But a harsh word, stir up anger. Folks, anger does nobody any good. Nobody. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on evil and on the good. The wholesome tongue, look at this, is a tree of life. Folks, I understand we need to correct our children. I understand we need to discipline our children. But we don't need to discipline in anger. We don't need to be disciplined in anger. And we don't need to just keep chewing them out and chewing them out. Once they paid the price, let it go. Let it go. And I am telling you, you want to you wanna raise an angry child? You be angry towards that child. Okay, you be unfair towards that child. You belittle that child. And I am telling you, you're going to raise an ang- angry child. We don't need to do that. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. And that's why, folks, you know what this generation is now? I call it the quitters. They just quit. If if you don't like it and it gets too tough or it's not going your way, they'll just walk off. Folks, I'm telling you, I was in a generation. I'm telling you, my work ethic, one of my bosses, here's what my first boss says. Don't call in, crawl in. I'm serious. My first boss told me, Don't call in, you crawl in. My first football coach said, you don't give up. I don't care if we're getting beat 34 to nothing, which we was in a a game. And I'm telling you, I hurt my arm. He says, get back out there. You're not going to quit. We've got two minutes left in the game. We're getting beat 34 to nothing. Coach White, never quit. Never quit, folks. God is on our side. Be strong. Encourage one another in the faith. Encourage our our children. Show a work ethic like you've never seen before. Then last one, James chapter 3. James 3. James 3 verse 6. In the tongue is a fire. But we can't relate to this right now. We got so much water, our place couldn't catch on fire if it wanted to. All right? But the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, sin. Folks, I believe, other than our thoughts, okay, other than our thoughts, we sin more with our mouths than we probably do with anything. Okay? I'm, okay? Point this way, three are coming back at me. Okay? We. Okay? Our thoughts, Hard, hard, hard. But we can correct our mouths, folks. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say nothing at all. The tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Folks, I'm telling you, an ugly mouth just ruins everything. An ugly mouth ruins everything and sets on fire the course of nature and it sets on fire by hell. We act more like the devil with our mouths probably than any other thing that we have. That's what it's saying. I know it's strong, but folks, I'm just reading the Word. I'm just telling you the Word. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Man, we can make whales jump up. We can make dolphins dance on water. That's what he's saying. But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. 
I'm telling you, if a rattlesnake come into your house, you would do everything to defend your child against that rattlesnake. Okay? I mean, I'm feeding Keegan, and it's coming in on the floor. I'm handing that baby over to Lori, and I'm go- I hate snakes, but I will kill that snake or I will die trying. Folks, that's what he's saying. Man, we've got to get control of our tongues. We've got to get control of our mouths. Folks, everything we say, everything we do, reflects the character of Jesus Christ. He was on trial. He was called a lot of ugly things. Bells above. Folks, that was Lord of the Flies. Okay? He was called a liar. He was called a lot of things. Read the trial, folks. Read the notes in the Gospels. And he did not say a word. Folks, there's times in your life that you're better off just not even responding. And I understand that may make some people mad, but that's their problem, not yours. You are better off being quiet than getting into a fight, a verbal fight with someone. Folks, we need to give words of wisdom. We don't have to talk all the time. We don't have to get the last word in. Our words need to be words of kindness and gentleness and meekness and love and all the fruits of the Spirit. I pray that some of you will do what I'm going to do starting tomorrow. Will you go with me through the book of Proverbs? Will you take your time? I'm going to read my regular thing in the morning, but at night, every night, I'm going to read a chapter of Proverbs. And I know it's already convicted me. It's already, just studying for this sermon's already convicted me. And folks, by God's will, I am going to do better with my mouth. And I hope you will too. Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your words of wisdom. God, thank you for the areas that you have pointed out in our lives today. Lord, God, we need to listen to instructions. Listen, listen, listen. We need to work. We need to work. And God, we need to control our tongues. So God, if there's one here that doesn't know You, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray if there's a Christian that needs to rededicate their lives, that they'll rededicate it. God, I pray, Lord, if somebody needs to follow the Lord in baptism, they've been saved, but they have not been scripturally baptized, I pray that they would consider that this week. And God, if there's anybody here that wants to join the church, or they know what we stand for, we stand for the Word of God. We stand on the Word of God. The Word of God is our instruction booklet. It is what we will teach, it's what we preach, and it's what we will live. So God, just work in this time of invitation. God, we give it to You. Lord, it's totally up to You what You want to do with it. Lord, we'll be careful to give You the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.